All right. I'm Camilla Taylor, and I created Eric Sanders' Moments. And I'll just dive in. This is Eric, the other person. So Eric, you chose a really limited palette for this series compared to the paintings that we've seen from you in the past. What was it like working with such a limited palette and what informed that decision? Um, well, it's quite different from painting because in painting, uh, especially with abstract painting, I, I, I lean very heavily on color as a, a big part of the aesthetic experience I'm trying to create. And um, there's a combination um, of practicality that in printing, it's just the nature of printing that uh, it's very complicated to keep and uh, because it chews up lots of equipment and space um, to use a lot of colors. So you're kind of practically limited to a more narrow band with the colors. Um, so th that was the pragmatic side of it, but uh, also I sort of, um, I put a lot of thought into, well, originally I actually had a set of colors that I was going to use for the show. And um, as I started out making work for the show, it occurred to me, um, since these colors were, were supposed to kind of represent the dynamics of this relationship, that Anna and I um, had this pre-existing language that we used amongst ourselves that referenced colors um, that expressed our individuality and also sort of like the the fusion of effort uh, and relationship between us. And we got that from um, a gentleman who's on this call actually, his name is, uh, is Bill. And uh, Bill does relationship coaching for, for Anna and I to try and keep our relationship tuned up as best we can. And um, in working with Bill, we always use blue to express Eric activities or uh, things about Eric and we use red to, describe things about Anna. And then when we're doing things together, we get purple because the two mix together. And so I thought, oh my gosh, this is so perfect that we already have this pre-existing language and I can just lean into that language and have the work um, express uh, that pre-existing language between us. So uh, it, it was very challenging to go from painting to using this narrow limit band of colors. But once I latched onto that, it, it got a lot more easy. That's really personal to share that information about your relationship in your series. What was it like sharing that intimacy in your artwork when beforehand a lot of your work was a little more abstract and open ended? This is so specifically about your relationship and so personal. How was it sharing that? Uh, I'm not going to um, <laughs> split hairs or mince words. It was very daunting. Uh, it was uh, on the verge of terrifying because just to be an artist um, is putting yourself out there in the first place and you're going to open yourself up to public scrutiny and judgment and, um, and then to take it beyond a level that I was um, used to because that abstract art is, is much less revealing about your your inner self um, to you know, sort of specifically touch on aspects of my my relationship, um, you know, that was that was like doubling down on vulnerability. So it was it was a bit uh, uh, scary, <laughs> for lack of a better word. How have the responses been to it? Um, I, I was surprised because I've done previous shows and and. Uh, um, and then usually with a show, I'll put out something that called a, a show statement explains what the nature of the show is. And in previous shows, um, people have talked to me about the work in the show, but never about the statement. But in this show, they really um, resonated with the show statement because it talked about um, essence and elements of a relationship and what I was trying to tap into for the show. And a lot of people responded. Um, in interesting ways, I'll just give a little story about one, uh, one time a friend was coming over with his girlfriend and they pulled up in the driveway and um, I opened the door from the second floor to say hello to him. 
And my friend's girlfriend yelled at me, Eric, I saw your thing. And I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> what thing? She says, oh, this, the, the, the writing, the statement about your show, I read it, it's so beautiful. It's just, uh, you know, and so that, that for me was a, a very unique kind of experience of people relating to the elements of the show um, based on the, the statement about the show. Mm -hmm. So it was quite different. I even had a friend who- had another connection that I thought was hilarious um, that I want to remind you of about uh, a friend of yours who was a little uh, more yeah. <laughs> yeah, a friend uh, I might be on the call, uh, teased me and said, you couldn't possibly have written it. You must have copied and pasted it from somewhere on, on the internet. <laughs> Way too articulate to be, but uh, those are my words. They are indeed. Um, Okay, well, I wanted to share a specific piece and have you tell us a little bit about it. I'm going to share screen so everyone can see it. If you want, you can also pull up the website that Christine linked to in the chat if you want to see all of the work at once. So Catnap 1, I think it is, and 2 were the, the images that you chose to publicize the show, to represent the show. Mm -hmm. And I think they're really representative of it. Would you tell us a little bit about these two pieces? So here's one and here's two. Um, well, the, the images in the show were very um, intentionally chosen um, based on, uh, I was trying to get um, sort of an authentic look into what our relationship looked like. And I realized as I was culling through um, different pictures and images that could potentially be used as content in the show, um, that generally when we were, we were posing for pictures, it just was kind of like not very natural and not very organic. So I was going through years of photos of, of interactions between us and decided to only use ones where we weren't looking at the camera or we weren't like posing. So I wanted something really natural. And Anne and I have this little game that we play with each other where when the one person falls asleep or dozes off, we'll take a picture of that person and then send, send a text to them uh, of that picture just to kind of playfully tease each other. And so this is one of my um, teasing photos <laughs> of Anna. And it's actually in this room where you can see that that couch behind me is ac the actual ca same couch that's in the same is and I was working here on my computer and she came in to um, talk to me and keep me company and she had been working really hard and fell asleep in that position so I ran over and snapped that picture of her. Um, and there's other pictures of me sleeping in here um, that she uh, returned the favor as well. <laughs> so. I think it's interesting how in both of these images they're cut in half, but in very different ways. Yeah, um, in both of them, I tore the image in half and then paint and then use different colors ink to capture different parts of the photo. Uh, in this one that you're showing right now, I did a process called Shinkale, where you take a very thin kind of like almost like rice paper and I uh, transfer the image onto that piece of rice paper and then collage that piece of rice paper to match as close as I could with the other half of her image um, on the couch. And it came out fairly, fairly interesting looking. What brought you to printmaking initially? Uh, it is a little more limiting in some ways than painting. Mm. And that's how you and I met. I'm a yeah. printmaker. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what attracted you to it. Um, well, as I, I am a huge fan of the masters. And for me, the guy at the top of the mountain is Picasso. And Picasso has a very um, broad approach to art. He does sculpture. He, he did um, um, ceramics, he did painting. Uh, and he did printmaking. And so when I 
decided to dive into being an artist, I thought I'm going to, I want to be multi um, approached and use other aspects of creating art other than just painting. And that may, may have proved to be a mistake. I don't know, but it was just a, a decision that I made early on in my, in my art career that I wanted to um, have different aspects and different creative modes. And, uh, and also I have a background in manufacturing for, for 30 years. Um, and so the machinery of printing is very similar to the kind of machinery that I worked with for 30 years, it's just a smaller version of it. And so I could, it was just kind of intuitive for me to be able to relate to the, the printing processes and using machinery. And I, and I like the difference from painting that you're sort of, uh, it was like in a mechanized aspect, you're, you're, you, know, you have this give and take with machinery, whereas in painting, it's just you, the brush and the canvas. It's, much more uh, stripped down. So um, that that was basically what drew me to printmaking. I love that um, it's kind of mirroring of your background in mechanization and machinery and how you chose to become an artist since then. And then you kind of brought it back again with printmaking. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, printmaking also brings up these issues of scale with your painting, uh, some of them that I've seen are massive. They barely fit yeah, in the yeah. big high ceiling studio. Mm -hmm. But with printmaking, they're comparatively much smaller. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how that's informing the artwork. Sure. Um, so I, I actually am well into the um, creating the work for my next show. and. Um, just to give you a sense of what the dimensions of those pieces are, they're nine, seven to nine feet tall and 10 to 12 feet wide. Um, and these two, the two dimensions I used in this show were 11 by 14 was the big ones and eight by 10 were the little ones. And um, there was actually a fair amount of thought in the fact of that things were would be at that scale because since the whole, conception of the show was to be uh, sort of a look at something personal and intimate. The idea of interacting with a piece of art that's really small that only you can see it, only one person at a time can look at it, as opposed to my other work where half a dozen good people could stand in it and be wrapped around by the entire piece that it created a much more sort of like intimate and personal relationship with the work. Um, so I, I really enjoyed uh, the challenge of switching from these two very different scales and sort of the, the aesthetic um, nuances that came out of changing the scale. Yeah, the intimacy of the prints are almost like the intimacy of the relationship where we, the viewer, are the stand-in for the other figure in the relationship when we see mm -hmm. them yep. in person because they're small and There's a method to precious in that yeah. respect. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little about the title of the show about moments. Moments feels really fleeting and ephemeral. Um, well, there was a lot of thought that went into that as well. Um, there was a, a, a big list of names that I started out with originally, but um, I, I landed on this one as being the, the perfect or ideal way to express what I was trying to capture in this body of work. And that, um, especially since I had specifically gone back through all of our iPhone photos to find all the images that went in the show. I was basically capturing things that were captured as moments in our relationship. And um, uh, one of the things I've learned uh, getting to the, this stage in life that I've been at is that because I've lost people I've been very close to and you, it gives you this sort of realization having gone through that, that all you have left is moments, these, you know, the, the, these little memories. Um, so these things, I realized that these, those things are really important. So I thought moments was kind of the most powerful way to sum up um, what was being captured here in this work. Yeah. I think it works really well nicely. Mm, How has the other party involved in this series responded? So Anna is almost as much an artist as you are in this series because she's the subject of so many of them and also the photographer sometimes. 
Yeah. How she felt about it. Uh, I did ask her, and um, fortunately, <laughs> she she was quite happy with it. Uh, she liked. Um, I think she felt like it was like some a form of like um, validation about our relationship and my engagement, our relationship and and my happiness with our relationship. And so I might, I might be reading more into it than there was there, but that was my impression. She's here. She could tell us in the chat. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> she, yeah, she can re rebut my statement <laughs> at the after party. Yeah. Um, these are really photographic and representational. Mm -hmm. so the sort of overlap you're playing with with the re representational work and the abstraction. Yeah, um, going into creating this body of work for the show, um, I was at a point in my painting career where I had been, I started out working primarily in abstraction and um, I decided that I wanted to take on scaling an impossible mountain and that is to start working on figurative uh, paintings and drawings and elements. And uh, so I've been working very hard on that. And um, as I started to get more comfort and a, a bit of mastery of figurative elements, I, th I realized that it was interesting when you combine them together um, and kind of did both at the same time. And um, so when I was thinking about the work in the show, I thought, oh, can it be cool if I could sort of transpose my current interest in combining abstracted elements and figurative elements together. And so I thought, that's what I'm gonna try to do in this, um, in this work. And, and so I used the Xerox lithography as the figurative part of um, the work. And then I used my own freehand uh, painting and marks um, to abstract the images as well. Let's talk about a couple of those pieces specifically. Sure. So I'm going to share screen so everybody can see the piece we're talking about. First, I love the story behind this one. I'm not gonna tell you, you gotta share it with us, Eric. All right, um, well, as I confessed before, Ann and I have this little standing uh, tradition be between us to take pictures of each other when we're, uh, we're sleeping and she was sleeping <laughs> in my car. So I was actually took this picture while I was dri driving down the 405 freeway. And um, in the entire picture, you can see all of her sleeping uh, with her head uh, leaning to the side on the chair. Um, but for this, um, what I focused in on what was sort of like the um, central, most beautiful part of it, um, which was just the, the very sort of serene uh, image of her hands clasped, clasped like that. And this piece is called Eminence Clasp. And um, that color purple is actually known as eminence purple. So that's where the, the title of the piece came from. There's a real specificity with her jewelry too, that if it were just bare hands, then there would you can't you couldn't really place the person. But because there's this personality in the rings she's chosen to wear, it tells that you so much about the person who belong who the hands belong to. And this this image is actually in several uh, pieces of work that I've done and in several paintings where, I, and so I, I know every little shadow uh, on her fingers and her hands and where her hand butts up against her, her knee. Because I, when you paint something, you, you really have to become very familiar with all the little nuances to create those different shades and colors. So this is a very familiar image to me. So. Um, it was pretty logically included in the show. And it also kind of brings up something I thought was interesting. You talked about earlier how so many of these are photos when you two are sleeping. Mm -hmm. And I know when I've seen this work before, I commented that you both seem to be very graceful sleepers. Oh. 
<laughs> There's no photos of anybody drooling. Well, those exist. Business. Those exist. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we, I did not use them as content for the show. <laughs> but they do exist. Well, so catnap that we already talked about, and then this one mm -hmm. more that I would love you to share up with us that I'll screen share right now. Okay. Uh, really bring about the specificity of what you're doing, that they're about the figure sleeping. So oneric gesture, I think this is uh -huh. one. Yeah. Um, and two. Tell us about the title and about the photo and the prints, the work. Um, the uh, oneric is a term that means um, pertaining to sleeping and dreams. And so, um, and this is Anna returning the favor. She caught me sleeping um, on a couch with my hand in front, in front of my face in, um, in a weird kind of gesture. Um, and so uh, I thought that, you know, this is a great, great piece to include in the content. And um, so the title is based on, I think it's an old Greek or Latin term for sleeping in dreams. And um, I'm pretty sure I was dreaming about something at this point, just based, based in my hand position. One thing I love about this series is how you're revisiting the same image multiple times. Mm -hmm. it brings up again that machining history that you have, that you're taking these elements and then you reinterpret them. And so we get to revisit that same image again with a new layering of color or a new way that you cut it up in an interesting way. Well, and, um, to be honest, um, I was, Originally, I was doing it um, more as like sort of like seeking perfection, trying to get like the best image. Because I was under the impression when you curated the show that you would just use one of each thing. And so when you used a couple versions of it, I thought, oh, that's that's quite interesting. And then you could see the relationship between the two of them. Um, but it does drive home the fact that these are or what's called in the printing terminology monoprint. So there, each one is is a unique piece, and and it's not like regular printing where you have a plate and you ink the plate and you can crank out twenty five of them and you just label them one through twenty five. These are all very much like paintings. Or they're, they're, each one is a unique piece. They're they're handmade each time. Okay. Well, uh, those are the questions that I had prepared to talk to Eric about. So I think it's time for us to open it up to your audience. Would you unmute everybody, Christine? And I can read some of the questions that have already been asked. Yeah, so, I got it. There are Monica good. Marks asked you, for you and your process, which painting or printmaking makes you feel more vulnerable? Between what and what? Painting or printmaking? Through which do you feel more vulnerable? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it, I don't know if it'd be, to me, it seems surprising that um, I'm, I feel much more vulnerable about painting than I do about printing. Um, and I, the best I can figure out as to why is that it seems like people have spent their life being familiar with painting. And so everyone has an interior judge uh, that lives in their head. So when they look at a, a painting there, they think, oh, that's not a good painting or wow, that's really good. That's interesting. Um, whereas printing, since it's kind of off the beaten path and people don't see it and don't consider it that often, um, they're not as judgmental. So I kind of feel like my painting is being scrutinize at a much higher and being held to much higher standards than my print work. So um, for whatever reason, <laughs> I, even though the content of the show was was more personal and, uh, and daunting to publicly portray, the actual techniques going into it, I feel more comfortable um, with print work than painting. Yeah, Anna does say she loves it. So that's good. <laughs> 
And then Emily Wiseman says, the series is really compelling, bringing to life the vulnerability of intimacy as well as the strength of love. And then we have a question from Ryan Gordon Jackson. Can you tell us more about your attraction to an increased interest in scale as it relates to your work? It seems to have been or is now driving a force in your work. Now a driving force in your work, apologies. Yeah. Um, well, as I touched on before, um, the latest work that I'm working on is, is very large. You met, you met Eric, right? Hey, Barry, I recognize oh, your yeah. voice. Hey, Eric. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, a little late checking in. Welcome to the party. Um, Watching the LA Open, but this is more important. Yeah, I'm uh, so to answer, the, answer the question. Um, uh, there's something about uh, about working at a very large scale that. Um, there's a lot to it. First of all, it's incredibly physical. It's exhausting to work with really, really big characters. And just to prep them is um, it's like a, a ton of, it, it's just physical labor. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted when I work on the big pieces. So it takes, there's something, you know, you, you, you put more into it, but you kind of get more out of it because you invested more of your energy, sweat and energy into it. But also, um, Mm. there's something about when you paint at that scale, you're, you're committing yourself in a way that is very different when you're committing at a, when you're painting at a smaller scale, because you're putting a lot of money into it. And the odds of anyone ever buying that painting are extremely limited. Um, it, because it's, no one has very few people First of all, there's not, not a large audience for anyone to buy any particular piece. But then secondly, we're, who's going to have a, a wall that can fit a, a 12 foot wide painting on it? Um, so you're kind of painting um, for the art world and not necessarily for a piece that it could ever be sold. So that's kind of like a, a, a leap of faith and um, putting yourself out there. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, Ryan. <laughs> and Will B asks, it seems to me that the juxtaposition of the photo and the printing process embraces both the objective and subjective of what's viewed. Can Eric speak to this more? How did you expect the viewer of the piece involved? Uh, I couldn't hear a couple of the words about subjective and objective. Uh, apologies, there's a windstorm in my neighborhood, so I might be cutting out a hair. So he says, the printing process embraces both the objective and the subjective. So we uh, have the photographic and then also your different approaches. How do you expect the viewer of the piece involved? How do I speak, expect the viewer of the piece involved to do what? I don't know. How oh. did you expect the viewer? Can of the you piece hear of me? Well? Yes, we can, Will. Hi, I'm, I'm Will B. Um, I, Eric, hey, I was just curious that, you know, photography is kind of captures an image in somewhat of an objective way. And then yes. you do this really cool thing with printing and make it kind of your subjective experience of the objective. So yeah. I'm wondering how that was for you, that process. And then also, since you're talking about uh, your, the subject is an intimate thing in your life, how did you want us to view it? Did you have a, a point of view of what you wanted to convey to us or what, we want, what you wanted us to experience? Um, okay, so I answered the part A. Um, <laughs> I'm always asking many questions. <laughs> it, it was interesting Good question, um, well. because um, I was very, conscious of the fact that I didn't want it to look just like a photograph. I wanted it to look highly as abstracted as possible, but still um, there's, there's a couple pieces in there where it's very difficult. There's one called Obscured that's in that series where it's really difficult to see the photographic image in there, but it's in there. Um, so I was trying to be on that ragged edge of where you could make out something um, intuitively, but it didn't 
present itself as obvious. So I, I enjoy the interplay um, between abstraction and objectivity. Um, and to answer your, the B part of that question, I honestly didn't know. Um, this was the first time that I ever sort of made this leap of faith with presenting material that was this personal. And um, I didn't think, I was more worried about what I thought about it <laughs> and, and my own insecurities and vulnerability um, and sort of was leaving it up to the viewers to figure out um, how they were gonna process it. And I, I found myself being a, a very interested onlooker in how people have been processing it and, and learning from that. Um, so it, it's frankly, it's been a learning experience for me. So it sounds like you trusted, as long as you were gonna have an experience with the page, then you trusted the process that therefore it would transfer and we'd have an experience. You didn't know what that would be, but as long as you were honest with that experience and, and the page, then you you kind of knew that we would somehow have a reaction or a response. Yeah, I, um, well, I trusted in the aesthetic quality of the work and, and then was hopeful that then there was some, you know, there was something more fulfilling and compelling intellectually beyond just the aesthetic part of it. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. And like Will is doing, feel free to unmute yourself. You don't have to just ask questions in the in the chat. I don't need to be proctor unless you prefer. That is okay. I don't mind. Okay. Oh. I'll, I'll ask Go ahead, Jen. Then. Um, Eric, let's see. I, I think I wanted, I was wondering the role of printmaking and particular uh, monotypes had uh, with your painting practice, because traditionally painters use mono printing uh, and monotypes as a way to inform their painting. Have you found that there's been an, a kind of a dialogue between your painting and your, your monotypes or prints? I mean, yes. okay. Yes, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, uh, because I was coming out of painting into printmaking, um, I was heavily leaning on the, the fact that mono printing would allow me to bring my uh, painting background and create painterly type marks and, and effects um, in the work. So um, that, that gave me a lot of comfort and, um, and, and, and engagement with it as well. Mm -hmm. Do you find also, this is just a, a sort of a backup question. Do you find um, something preferable about the thin thinness of a mono print and the white of the paper being able to kind of do the talking as opposed to painting where you have to kind of build something with the paint where you're building whites or building forms and things like that. Is there, do you find you have a preference for one for the other or do you feel like the two kind of uh, balance each other out? Or do you find it hard maybe getting into one versus the other? I, I just, I, or maybe you don't feel a separation. I, I'm just. <laughs> no, I, I definitely, they're, they're hugely different. And, mm -hmm. um, and I was very conscientious of that. And um, um, one of the things I realized was that printing is, in a sense is easier because it, the, the, the white really acts as part of the work where in painting, you know, the gesso is like, you know, the evil stuff that you have to get rid of. And, um, and it's like very uh, groundbreaking if you let canvas show through in your work. Um, so, or you can say edgy. Um, so I, was at first because of my painting background that there was all this exposed um, paper felt very nervous about it but then I kind of le learned to embrace it and just let see that it's an it's a part of printing and it's quite natural and, and it's beautiful so it took me a while to, to stop feeling guilty that I didn't have all these layers stacked up hiding all the paper but once once I embraced that um, I, I really started to like it and uh, I love the simplicity of a kind of like you know Japanese calligraphy where it's just the ink and the paper and that's all it takes to create a beautiful image. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Did David Butler want to ask a question? It looks like he's trying to. No, no, no 
active questions right now. Just saying hi. <laughs> oh, hi, Lauren. <laughs> That's my sister. Raphael has a question. A follow-up question. Oh, is, go ahead, Will. I, I, yeah, and I, but I don't want to, if anyone else. Um, Eric, um, did, did the colors ever surprise you? So since uh, Anna is red and you're blue and you, the, the, the relationship is, is purple, yeah. did the colors, when working on an image, say, of Anna that then turned, ended up being blue, not red, did, did you have any surprises when you finally did the, were in the process of it? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean um, about being surprised about what? Well, it's, it seems like if you say, if uh, there was a, a, a print of, of Anna right. and you uh, chose the, to, uh, to make that blue, then it would uh, imply that it was more about you because you represent right. blue and your view of Anna versus just making it red, which was Anna's, Anna being Anna. So, or the purple. So did you play around with that at all? Or did, was there any surprises there? Well, um, when you go to ink a plate, um, uh, because I knew uh, what image I was working with, I was very conscientious. Okay, this is Anna's image, so I'm using some shade of red here. Yeah. It can be pink, it could be neon pink, it could be almost like a, a lazarine crimson red, but it, it needed to be a red. So there was never a time where an image material, you know, accidentally became blue, a very, a very uh, kind of methodical process. Um, um, but I, what I was surprised is that when I saw images of her in red or pink, um, they were really stunningly beautiful. There, there's a lot of images that I really like that are actually not in the show um, um, of her, of her um, in various, um, images so that's the extent of the surprise with respect to the colors thanks that uh, the end of that comment gets a good lead into my question um uh -huh. i can and it's actually for both of you um i wanted to i guess uh there's a of course this is just my it could just be my interpretation but there's an overwhelming sort of sense of serenity about the show um, and it, you know, it's really beautiful. And I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm assuming a, a little bit of that is due to the sort of the somnolescent theme as it is. Uh, but, um, uh, I also wondered, um, uh, Camilla, how much you feel like you affected, uh, the, I guess the presentation of the relationship through this, um, you know, your selections. And then to Eric, how much of your sort of, you know, um, you know, there's no shattering dishes or I'm not sure if that stuff happens with you guys or not, but it just definitely, it feels like it has a, oh, sorry, a, you know, a, a particular feel. And was that intentional or, or, um, or do you guys just really sleep a lot or I don't know, anyway. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, you want to go first, Kibel, on your part? Sure. Uh, well, there were a lot more works to pick from than I uh, ended up in the show, obviously. Eric made a ton. Um, you were, it seemed like you were working nearly every night in the studio for the months leading up to the show. And the ones that I were I was, ended up being more drawn to were primarily of Anna, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was you had more content of Anna to begin with. You just had more photos of her to work with. Yep. But then I think from your perspective, when you made the prints of Anna, you could really feel a sense of affection and intimacy mm -hmm. that was not the same as the self-portraits. Mm -hmm. And so that may have uh, more heavily influenced how I think there's more Anna than Eric in the show. But in the end, it's kind of all Eric because you made all of them. It's all your perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would echo that, that um, I was pull, I pulled, for me, for my phone, it was, I was able to go back years and years and years and look at all my images. So most of the, uh, so there were more images of, 
me taking images of her than of her. So I had to kind of like, you know, go to her and say, give me, give me stuff from your phone. So I was extracting them from her. And so I didn't get as many uh, images of her, of me in, uh, you know, to, pull, to cull from. Um, that said, the, um, there was, there is one image in the show where uh, we were actually in Michigan and we went to an ax throwing um, range. And I was surprised that, that Camilla picked that one because that that's the one image in there that doesn't look like a real serene, affectionate moment. Um, so there was some images that I used that were were more um, more active. Um, and so uh, I, I was a student sitting back and enjoying watching what, what Camilla picked as the, uh, the final cut for the, the content of the show. One thing I liked about this one is as we talk about the color story and how that really informs how you're, uh, once we know that, how we're interpreting the pieces is it's in an anacolor already. It's like this, this magenta, right? But then you have this overlay of indigo so it almost feels like, oh, this was Anna doing this, but maybe Eric was the one who, who wanted to go ax throwing potentially, or you both just happened to enjoy it. I don't know, but that little overlay, the Collagraph second color changes how I initially interpreted the piece. And it's nice to have one in there where someone's very active. Of all of these very dreamlike, sleepy pictures of the relationship of, you know, Eric and Anna looking gracefully asleep or walking on a beach, and then we have Anna throwing an axe. So there were images of dishes being smashed, Brian. It just didn't make the final cut. <laughs> that was a good question. Thank you, Brian. May I may I ask a question? Absolutely. Fantastic. Eric, I love yes. your work and I love that you continue to grow and push and it's inspiring to watch. And as a fellow artist, I just it's been awesome to watch and you inspire me, man. Um, so my question for you, because I observe how you have a like a, a forward thinking and innovative perspective about um, you know, mixed media and the different ways that you're growing, learning, and then weaving them all together. So were there any things that you learned through this process, any additional insights or techniques that as you're going through this specific process, you said, ooh, aha, okay, I'm going to grab this and maybe it's going to come back later to play in some of either your large format pieces, abstract pieces, or any of your other works in the future? Um, yeah, I, I'm entirely smitten with the Xerox transfer and I'm I, I have this future series <laughs> body of work that I want to combine um, this lithography transfer um, onto canvas um, sort of like Warhol um, was doing by using silk screening um, I, I've already figured out ways where I can take things that are at the scale that you can Xerox them but get them, stitch them in together in a huge image and do it, you know, like on an eight foot by or 10 foot size painting. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely already thinking out there in the future how to employ some of the, the techniques I picked up on this. Um, one other little nuance that, I, that was was interesting that I learned um, through the, the mono print processes and this is that um, when I, transfer the images um, onto paper, or in some cases I use canvas board. If I had painted it with acrylic paint, for some reason the ink grabbed on the acrylic paint really well, whereas on mm -hmm. oil paint, it didn't grab on very well and the image wouldn't show up. So I started to learn that um, if I wanted the image to be more uh, discrete and observable, I would use acrylic paint on my uh, surface preparation um, for like the, the abstract abstracted element of the, of the piece. So that's another little process nuance that I picked up through the process. Awesome. I love it, man. Keep going. You're an inspiration. Keep going. Thank you, Raf. Anna asks, hi, Eric. 
Can you give some background on the pieces Toiling and A Man's Place? Oh. <laughs> While you're talking, I'll pull those up. <clears throat> Eric, tell us about them. Um, I can't see them, but fortunately, I know what they look like. Oh, I haven't pulled them up yet. Sorry. Okay. Um, Here we go. Uh, so this is me working in my studio. And I'm actually working on a very large piece here. Uh, these pieces are unstretched canvas and so and they're so big that I have to lay them on the floor and work on them when they're laying on the floor. Um, so um, I think there's some of that sort of um, same kind of level of appreciation or respect or love um, that you can see in my images of Anna is coming through in this one of her watching me do my work. Um, at least <laughs> that's what I want to see in it. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's what I'm doing there. I'm, I'm on my hands and knees and toiling over a, a very large painting. Here's the other one. Hence the title, Toiling. Um, in this image, uh, and a snap this of me, I was making uh, pizza for my kids and um, well, for the whole family, um, but they're, they're usually the ones that vote uh, for me to make pizza. And uh, I'm, I've got a cheese grater there and I'm grating cheese in the kitchen. And so I made this little um, tongue in cheek joke about, um, you know, the, the old um, sexist comment, a woman's place is in the kitchen. So I said, this. This is the man's place um, of me working in the kitchen. Thanks for asking about those, Anna. Nice photos too. It's a nice softball, thank you. <laughs> some good teamwork there. You yeah. Too. Do we have some more, any more questions? Eric, um, I have a question. You had mentioned that you were inspired or influenced by Picasso. Uh -huh. um, have you looked at any printmakers and you know emulated their work or been influenced by their work in the process? Or was it kind of just getting in the studio and experimenting with printmaking? Yeah, for some reason, um, I do that religiously and almost to the point of driving some of my teachers crazy. Um, with painting, I, I riff off of a reference or do master copies of, or are heavily influenced by other painters. But in, in printmaking, for some reason, I was very comfortable in just going in there and just playing sort of in a vacuum of having very little uh, um, influences or, or references of other um, printmakers other than Picasso. Um, that I was aware of, and, and a little bit of um, Rauschenberg and um, and um, um, on a blank on oh sorry Warhol any Warhol. Those are always good ones. Yeah, but it, 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 it's it's quite different, I'll, and I probably should go out there and now that I'm starting. To, I have a foundation to build off of and I could use some more creative input. So thanks for the prompt. All right. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, Any last urgent, interesting questions? I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, Alvaro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. take it away. Yeah, um, congratulations on your show. I Thank found you. it very, I really like the concept of the two colors. And I just wanted to, um, I was just wondering if, if the color scheme 
um, kind of influence your 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 selection of of the photographs that you use to make the prints? Uh, no. Um, the 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 I I knew what the colors were going to be, um, and then I very um, very conscientiously just went and selected images, um, either complete images or intentionally tightly cropped images of different parts of photos, um, and then and so then then as a secondary step, uh, once I had the image. Um, that I started working with the colors, but I will tell you that um, I had a lot of difficulty um, with uh, the images being lost depending on how heavy the ink was, and um, and especially with the blues for me. And the blue is a very dark color, and a lot of times the images would just get completely lost in the darkness of the blue. So I really had to dance around with images, the Eric images. Um, and there was something that was going on during the, the months that I was working up. For some reason, in the beginning of this, uh, when I started working, I could get the lithography Xerox transfer to come across quite easily and clearly. But the later and later I got into the, towards the end of the creation of all the work, it kept getting, they kept getting more and more blurry <laughs> and less and less um, clear. So, and I never could figure out what, what was causing this deterioration in my process. I tried eliminating all these different variables and it just kept getting worse and worse. So towards the end, it was getting quite uh, difficult. Um, so um, that was sort of the, the balancing act I had to play with the colors and the, and the uh, Xerox images. And another comment, I just, I really like the, the scale that you use in uh -huh. terms to make it more accessible. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I think that really gives it a very um, interesting, um, uh, um, it makes it more uh, intimate for the viewer, I feel, when, when you have it at that size. Yeah. And, and the color scheme, you know, I, I think about primary, the two primary colors when you say red and blue, which is kind of cool. Kind well, of it, it, give you credit to Bill for that one because he, he's the one that chose those colors. <laughs> yeah, I really like that concept. So I thought it was really cool. And then hearing about the size, I think that just, I like that. Yeah. All just uh, elaborate ad campaign for Bill's uh, relationship coaching. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it accessible for, you know, just in, like when we think about love in general. It's, it's, yeah. It makes it double double gender regardless there's no i feel like gender um roles are being being um questioned in some sense you know just that, by the color i does, like that you did um i was worried about the fact that blue is often associated with like being depressed and down so i was a little i was a little concerned about whether my images would be sort of conveying like i was depressed about our relationship when it's certainly not the case um but fortunately, it didn't come across that way um, as as the work got uh, built out. So that was a, a relief for me. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much. You want to share any last thoughts, Eric? Uh, only that. Uh, it is truly an honor to have you, uh, all the people who are attending here. Um, it's, I just, I don't take it for granted the, the effort that it takes to get on a Zoom call and spend your, your Saturday evening or your Saturday afternoon uh, at one of these kinds of events. So I'm just wanting everyone, everyone to know I'm very appreciative for, you, for your attendance and participation. And it uh, means a lot to be able to share this experience with you. Oh, that's lovely. If you have not already, Christine links to the show in the comments. Take a look at it. It's a really beautiful collection of work. I'll let Christine finish this off. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Um, you know, as Camilla said, I put the link um, of the exhibition in 
um, in the chat. So if you have any questions, um, our email is also there. Please feel free to email us. And you know, most of you know Eric, so I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any more questions um, outside of this. Um, and you know, one day, like I would love to see this in person, Eric. So use this show to travel and you know, get it out there. So it's it's a beautiful show. Congratulations, and we're honored to be able to share it, you know, for you. So um, yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, the talk will it's on Shoebox Projects on Facebook, and it'll also be on um, YouTube if you want to rewatch it or share it with your friends or anything like that. So I hope everybody has a great Saturday and, you know, thank you for being here on Saturday. Thank you guys. Very much appreciated.